you're like me, you come every year to the Seder ready for the order that we are experiencing. That is to say, the night is called Seder, right? It's Seder night. Seder means order. And there's nothing as simple as going through the order of the Seder, after all. In fact, we even have a song that we sing about the order of the Seder. Um, some people were mouthing the words right now. Um, and uh, if you're in my family, I shared this with some people uh, last week. If you're in my family, you sing the order of the Seder, Kadesh, Orchatz, Karpas, Yachatz. And, and each section that you get up to, you sing up until that point, like Kadesh, Orchatz, Karpas. And that's it. And if you go over because you spaced out, then you have to start from the beginning. That's our family rule. Um, now, the problem with that order, and I'm going to share my screen here just so we can look at these words together for a moment. Um, so let me share the screen. There we Okay, so here are the 14 steps of, 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 the, of the Seder, those you were following in your source sheets on page one. And it looks very orderly after all, right? It's all laid out for you. You know exactly where we're going, where we've been, moving all the way down to Nirza, okay? The only problem is that this poem, which actually was written in 13th century France, um, and there are many poems that describe the order of the Seder along the style of this poem. Um, the problem is we spend most of our time in number five, in Magid, in the telling, but the song, the poem, actually gives us no detail about what we're going to do in the Magid section. So it's sort of like, great, you know, you're, you're moving so fast in the beginning, right? We just did Kiddush. Now we wash our hands. We didn't even have to say a blessing. And now we're eating the Karpas, and that's moving fine. And then we get to Magid, and it's like, wow, okay? You're so far away from washing or Hamotzi. It's just, you know, hours down, down, uh, down the evening. And yet we have no hint about how we're supposed to understand the structure of Magid itself. So whereas the, the, we've sort of been, been um, sold the line that we know the order of the Seder, we know the order of order, literally, the truth is we haven't spent a lot of time figuring out the order of Magid, and that's our goal tonight. And I would say part of the reason that we haven't figured out the order of Magid is because it's very hard to figure out the order of Magid. It, it, it does not make intuitive sense. It feels like text after text is being thrown our way Right, that you know, the, the, the four questions, the four sons, the five rabbis stay up all night. Who's reading the Pesach Matzamara? Right, you have all these things that are coming at you, but we don't exactly know how to understand or interpret them. So our um, our goal tonight is to jump into Magid itself and understand what the structure of Magid is um, in order to understand the seder of that part of of the evening. Okay, so that's our project for tonight, and we're going to do it. Um, by, by using a few of the tools that we have at our disposal. We have color coding that's coming your way. We have ancient Haggadot that have uh, a more simplified order. And um, we have the, some of the texts that serve as background to the Haggadah that we, uh, that we use. Now, I asked in the email, if you have a Haggadah that you, that you want, you don't, you're not required to have Haggadah to participate in the session, but you, if you have a Haggadah and you want to flip over to whatever page Magid starts, we can sort of see what's going on in your Haggadah as well. Um, but we're gonna look at this together through the sheet that I, that I have uh, prepared for all of us here today. Now, in terms of the mishmash, I wanna start with sort of what's difficult about Magid, all these texts that are flying at us, and take a look at them just for a minute, all as a bulleted list, <laughs> okay? So it's like we're doing the table of contents of Magid. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reshare the screen here so we can see this together, okay? So let me just share this again. We're moving down onto page two, okay? So this is the bulleted list of, of Magid. And if you, you know, again, some of these texts might be more and less familiar, right? We're all sort of focused and paying attention for Halach Ma'anya, this is the bread of our affliction. We're starting off strong. And then we've got um, uh, the four, four questions. We have Abadim Hayinu, we were slaves in Egypt. Then we sort of detour to the five rabbis who sat up all night in B'nai Brah. Um, we have this drasha of Ben Zoma about what the meaning of all the days of your life are. Then we get to the four children, everybody's favorite. But um, uh, then we sort of go, go in and out to all these different sort of sections of Magid until we get to, of course, in every generation, someone tries to destroy us. We have the Midrash on our Amio Vedavi, on this, uh, these verses in Deuteronomy. Uh, it, that detours off into a whole bunch of stuff about the 10 plagues. We have the great poem, Dayenu. 
Um, so these sort of the greatest hits are coming our way. Then all of a sudden, almost towards the end, as an afterthought, we get this statement from Rabban Gamliel. If you haven't said these three things, Pesach, Matzah, and Mora, you haven't actually fulfilled the obligation of, of the Seder, so you better say those things. And then in every generation, not that they're trying to destroy us, but now in every generation, we see ourselves as having come out of Egypt. And then finally, we get part of Halal, and then we get to the Bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem, Gal Yisrael, blessed are you God who redeemed Israel. And then you can finally drink the wine that you poured yourself way at the beginning of Magid. So if this seemed like a lot that I was throwing at you at this point, that's how it's supposed to feel. It feels like a lot because it is a lot. And there's no real rhyme or reason at this moment to trying to figure out how are we, um, how are we to make sense of the order of Magi. Um, so we are going to unpack Magid and we are going to look at the sort of original instruction manual of Seder night to get some sense of why Magid flows the way it does. And if it seems sort of a little curvy, that's because it is. But we're going to at least understand some of the, the curves that are taken during Magid. I want to use one other um, tool in our toolbox to try to figure out what's going on for this section of the, of the Haggadah. And that is the Haggadah that was discovered uh, in the Geniza, in the great treasure trove of Jewish texts, that um, shows us not only the Haggadah that we all today use, which is descended from the Babylonian tradition, the folks who brought us the Babylonian uh, Talmud, but actually we have, um, those of you who were learning with me this morning, we talked about this, we have the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah, the land of Israel Haggadah, the Haggadah that went out of style and out of fashion about a thousand years ago, but represents the tradition of the land of Israel. And as we're going to see, the, the land of Israel Haggadah is much shorter than our Magi um, that we have today. And that might give us some clues, at least to notice where the shared material is. And, um, and how we might be able to, um, to help make sense of our Magi based on this other text. Okay, so whenever you have an alternate tradition in Jewish history and there's divergences, if you look at the overlapping section, then you can start to understand, okay, this must have been something serious going on with the overlapping parts of what we have in our Haggadah and what happens in the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah. Um, so I'm going to, just in a moment, I'm going to share the screen and show you just of that bullet of this we just looked at, which sections appear in the Eretz Israel Haggadah. We're going to see it's a lot shorter. And I just wanted to note also that um, the, the publication of the Eretz Israel Haggadah really only took place starting about 25, 30 years ago. Uh, and scholars brought it to light for a much wider distribution. And I myself am basing a lot of uh, some of the learning that I did this year on a wonderful book called Manishtana. Uh, by a professor named David Henschke, who is at bar -Ilan University, and also some of the scholarship of Josh Kulp, who wrote uh, the, the commentary to what's known as the Schechter Haggadah. So those are two of my sources that I'm using here tonight. Okay, let's take a look together at the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah to try to start to make sense of what Magid is. And so I'm flipping over to page three, those of you following along on the sheet on your own. I'm going to reshare here so we can look at it together. Okay, here's our big mishmash of bulleted points for the Magid, the components. Uh, and if it is a lot, don't worry, that's how it's supposed to feel. Let's take a look at what it is in the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah. Okay, I bolded the part, took the same page, and I just bolded the parts that are in Eretz Yisrael. So notice, this is the bread of affliction, that's not there, right? You see how that's not bolded, but right underneath, it, it is bolded when it says four parentheses, three questions. Because as we're going to see, in the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah, even though we, we all love the four questions, and we love the four cups, and and the four children, but it actually was originally three questions. It's going to be important for us to understand the order of Magi, because we're going to see there are three answers to the three questions once we uncover that. But notice in Eretz Yisrael, you start with the questions, okay? That's where it starts. If you were going to just open up, you're living in, in the Eretz Yisrael community, which wasn't always in Eretz Yisrael. Sometimes it was in Egypt, and they were sort of expats. But you open up your Eretz Yisrael Haggadah, you start to read it, and you'll see that it starts off with the questions. Here are three questions, not four questions. And then look how much we skip. We don't do Avadi Mayinu. We were slaves in, in Egypt. We don't do the five rabbis who stayed up all night. We don't do the Drasha of Benzoma. If none of this, if you don't remember any of this, don't worry, because we're not doing it right now. Okay? We we don't do the four children. They didn't have it. Um, we don't do the, uh, um, the, the in, in the beginning, our, our ancestors were idol worshippers. We skip right to a passage that we may or may not remember, the verses in Joshua. Uh, at the end of the book of Joshua, we get a sort of summary of Jewish history. That's where they go. Okay, so they start with the questions, 
They move to the story of the Jewish people as reported in the book of Joshua. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that. We do uh, God keeps the promise uh, made to Abraham in the covenant of the pieces where God says way back in Genesis to Abraham, your descendants will be slaves um, in the land of Egypt for 400 years. Even though that number doesn't seem to hold constant, but let's just say you get the prediction and that's part of what we say on Seder night. We do get that every generation tr someone tried to destroy us. We get the drusha. The, the exposition of the verses in Deuteronomy uh, 26. And then we get, of course, where Bagamla says, if you don't say these three things, you got to say them. So that's in Eretz Yisrael Gada. And then we get every generation, we see ourselves, Hallel and the blessing. Okay, so you can see that more than half the material, again, just forget about the details, just zooming out to the whole thing. More than half the material is missing in the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah. Um, and, and, and by the way, there's nothing else that substitutes for it, meaning what you're seeing is the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah, just the bolded parts here. And indeed, they got to the meal much faster than we did, okay? They were just moving along the Magid section more quickly, okay? So that's part of, but now we can see, okay, there are certain elements of our Magid section that are common to both our tradition and the tradition of Eretz Yisrael. And now we might be able to sort of work our way in to figure out what's the structure based on some of the shared material. And we're gonna sort of play that out as we move along. Okay, with me so far? So we, all we've done so far is to say, Magid has a lot of stuff. And in Eretz Yisrael, they had fewer stuff, <laughs> okay? And, and, and yet, interestingly, they sort of follow the same order, uh, even though in Eretz Yisrael tradition, there was, there was less of it, okay. But we still haven't made sense, even of the reduced bulleted list of Eretz Yisrael that we really haven't made sense of any of it. And that is our project that we're going to do um, as, as promised here. So we're, I'm, mo I'm moving on to give us the roadmap of how I see Magi playing out. And I'm going to flip over to page four. Um, and in order to find the roadmap here, which I'll share in just a second, um, I, I, I'm basically taking the, um, the pared down instructions from the Mishnah, the earliest rabbinic text that tells us how to do uh, the, the Magid section, how to do Seder night. And we're gonna look at the different elements that the outline of Magid includes. And in that way, we're gonna see how we can find those elements in what we have today, okay? And this is where the color coding gets, uh, uh, takes off, so get excited about that. Um, let's share the screen again and take a look at this together, okay. So I'm scrolling on down to the very simple reduced Mishnah. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger so we can see it together. Does that work? Okay. Um, very simple reduced Mishnah here um, that, that gives us the components of Magi. Okay, so where, where are we in the Mishnah? The Mishnah for the tractate that deals with Sachim, almost the entirety of the tractate is about Hametz, how to like get rid of chametz and how to do the Pesach sacrifice, okay? So that, leave that aside. The last chapter of um, Masech HaPesachim is the order of the Seder itself, is the Magid section, and that's what we're going to zoom in here, okay? So it's organized around the four cups, and we are spending our time on the second cup. The second cup is the cup of Magid. It's so tempting. We fill up the cup, and then we, we wait to drink it for all of Magid. So that's what we're going to, uh, to work our way through here and pick out the elements that are, I think, guiding what we're doing here. Okay, so Mazgulo Koshini, they mix for him or they pour for him, for the leader, the, the second cup of the Seder. And then we get Bekana ben Shoel. And here the child asks. So asking is an element of what we're doing. That's the four questions or the three questions er er Israel version. That is definitely an element of what we're doing in Magi. We then have not necessarily a response to the questions, as we'll see. Like, I asked specific questions. Like, come on, why don't you tell me why we dip twice tonight? Or why don't you tell me why we can't eat chametz tonight? And instead, we don't really get an answer to that directly. What we get is uh, an instruction of the Mishnah, something else, telling our story, which I'm arguing is not the same as answering the questions. We will get to answer the questions, but right now we're telling a story. What's the story? The story takes us from degradation to praise. That's where the arc of the story is going. Okay, so I put that in blue. So red is the questions. Blue is telling your story from degradation to praise, okay? Which are not, those are different activities. Asking, telling the story. Then we have, the Mishnah tells us, Vidoresh. 
may arami oved avi. And you do something called drasha. You're doing midrash. You're doing exposition of verses. That doesn't, it might have originally been the same as starting from, from uh, shame and ending in, in praise. But we're going to take that as a separate activity. Okay, so you are doing drasha. You are doing exposition of verses. That's going to be part of what we're doing in Magid. And finally, the, uh, the, the, the second cup ends with Benomar Lefanav, hallelujah. Actually, in our version of the Mishnah, we add Benomar Lefanav, Shira Chadasha, hallelujah. Um, we say before, uh, before God, um, a new song, but really in the original Mishnah, it just said, we say before God, hallelujah, which is hallel, or part of hallel. We're going to get there, okay? But those are the four activities that we're doing in Magi. Okay, so we haven't come up with the order yet. We haven't figured it out yet. But we're at least trying to draw out the different strands. What do we got? We're asking questions. We're telling a story. We're doing exposition of verses. And we're praising God with Hala. Okay, those are four different activities. And our task is to work through Magid and try to at least categorize which part of what we do belongs to which section of what we've just identified. And perhaps... If we end up with a color-coded vision of what we're doing in Magi, we can at least make a little bit more sense. And you're going to see there's definitely a favorite of Magi in these four in these four options here, and that's what we're going to make our way make, make our way to do. Okay, so that's that's our our task here. What we've done is we have a big mishmash, we have a smaller mishmash that's Eretz Israel land of Israel Haggadah. Now, based on the instructions of the Mishnah. Uh, which is not mishmash, the Mishnah is telling us that there are four elements of what it means to, um, to celebrate this section of the Seder, um, asking questions, telling our story from degradation to praise, um, drushing or doing uh, uh, interpretation of verses, and praising God. Okay, those are the four elements. Each one has their own color, okay? So our, what we're going to do now moving forward is pick each of these, identify where they are, in the, the mishmash of Magid, and then be able to see the big map all together. Okay, you with me so far? Give me a, a nice shot, nodding of the head for with me. Okay, great. All right, let's go with, we're gonna take the easiest one structurally. <laughs> uh, it gets a little bit short trip because you, once you get there, you're sort of almost at the, at the food, so we're gonna race through it maybe, but we're, let's start with the praise the, from the end of the instructions, the no more lafana of hallelujah. We're gonna say before God, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Okay, that's what we're um, that's what we're doing here. So let me share the screen, and we're gonna take a look at that section. Okay. So again, in our map here, where we have uh, praising in purple. We're starting with the purple. Okay. And this is, by the way, although it uh, it seems a little bit out of order to start with the end of Magi, the truth is, when you look at ancient texts, the more you are towards the center probably the more central the part is, okay? This is good news, bad news for those of you who like the book of Leviticus, right? It's in the center of the Torah, and that is probably like the center of what we're, what we're driving around the Torah, the five books of Moses, that it's surrounded um, by Yikras in the middle. Um, and, and that's true about Magid as well, which is to say the closer you get to the middle of the Seder, the closer you're getting to some of the essential parts of what we're doing. Think about all the parts that the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah left off by the side of the road, and that was more towards the beginning than the end. The end was more stable of Magi than the beginning, okay? So, so let's go right to the end and take a look at the praising that we're going to see uh, at the end of Magi. Okay, so first of all, let's understand the strange thing about the praise on Seder night. The strange, the not strange thing is that we praise God by saying psalms of praise, right? That we know that as Hallel. That's Psalm 113 to 118, so it's six psalms, okay? And that's something that we say on every festival. Um, so it's actually totally not surprising that we would praise God with a liturgy that comes from the book of Psalms. What is surprising are two elements, the way this shows up on Seder night. Number one is you're saying Hallel at night. The truth is you never say Hallel at night. This is the only time you say Hallel at night. Actually, the, the oldest level of rabbinic text tells us that you, um, that you say halal 18 times a year and once on Seder night. They sort of make the distinction between the, uh, the whole year and, and the nighttime. So number one, which is strange, we may, we may or may not experience it as strange, but it's strange that we're saying halal at night. And the other piece that's strange is we're going to be saying only part of halal now and the rest of halal later. 
This is another place where the, remember that poem that we did at the beginning, Kadesh, or Kats, where does Hallel show up? Almost at the end, Hallel Nirzah, right? So Hallel, if all you had was the poem, you think, oh, Hallel, I know when we praise God, that happens way after the meal, after we've done Birkat Amazon, after we've done the Koman, after we open the door for Elijah, you're going to do the Hallel towards the very end. And that's true, except for the fact that the beginning of Hallel actually takes place in Magi, okay? So you're going to split the Hallel in half. So one, number one strange thing about Hallel is you say it at night, not during the day. Number two strange thing is you say Hallel in two parts. And what's extra strange about the fact that you're doing it in two parts is that if I told you that Hallel was made up of six psalms, so where would you divide the psalms? You would probably reasonably divide it three and three. Silly you, right? You're using mathematics as opposed to um, theme and content, okay? So what we're going to see is there is, in fact, a debate about where you divide Hallel but all, the maximal position is you do the first two psalms, Psalm 113, 114 in the Magid section. And the minimal position is you do so, just Psalm 1, Psalm 113, just one of the psalms you do and save all the rest for the, for the back half. Okay, so we're going to split Hallel and we're going to say some of them now, either one or two psalms now. And we're going to move the rest to the end way after, way after what? Well, way, way after really the food. So let's take a look at this just again. What's the structure of Hallel? Let's take a look. Um, Hallel is, we get this clue in elsewhere in the Mishnah. Um, the Mishnah talks about these people who missed Pesach for whatever reason, because they were uh, impure or because they were far away or whatever it was. And so they have to do a makeup Pesach. This is called Pesach Sheni. Okay, it's a month after Pesach. And the mission describes, well, what's the difference between Pesach Rishon and Pesach Sheni? What's the difference between the regular Pesach, the, 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 the first run Pesach, the Nisan Pesach, the one we do in, in the month of Nisan, versus the one you're going to do a month later. And one of the distinctions that they, uh, that they point out here, which I put in bold, is the first Pesach requires Hallel while eating the Pesach, but the second Pesach, the one a month later, does not require Hallel when eating. Okay, so if you're in makeup Pesach land, you're going to eat the Pesach sacrifice without Hallel. However, this teaches us something about the base case, our case of Hallel. Our case of Hallel means you sing Hallel while you eat. So imagine this as just the most basic structure of what we are doing on Seder night. We are eating the Pesach sacrifice while praising God. What did you do on Pesach? Where are you going to be for Pesach this year? I'm going to be where the lamb is. And when I get there, I'm going to sing songs of praise. That is my activity for original Pesach. Okay? I'm going to eat and I'm going to sing songs of praise. Now, those of you who have tried to sing while you eat... <laughs> It can get a little messy unless you were actually to make some adjustment to the singing. So let's say, let's split the, we'll, we'll encase the eating with singing. We'll start with singing, we'll eat, and then we'll finish with singing. And then I'll have fulfilled eating while praising God. It's as if there's sort of like a one, one approach to what Kalal is doing. Kalal is not just praising God, it's praising God around the meal. The meal itself is central, and I'm singing a little bit before, and I'm singing a little bit after, and then I have, the end result is, yes, I have been singing while I, 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 I've been eating, okay? Now this gets expression, this sort of sandwiching, uh, as it were, of the meal between the two different parts of Hallel gets expression also in another text that we have from ancient rabbinic sources, uh, from the Tosefta of Sephim, the sort of parallel to the Mishnah, where we get the following learning, the people of the city, who do not have someone to read for them Hallel in their own private home Seder, go to the synagogue and they read the first parak, the first section of Hallel. You could translate parak as chapter, but we're gonna see that's a debate. So most people translate it as section. So you, you read the first section of Hallel in the synagogue, why? Because you don't have anybody in your Seder who knows how to lead Hallel and you gotta do Hallel. So we're gonna go to the synagogue and that's where we're gonna do Hallel. And then they go and eat. Okay, you go to synagogue, get your first part of Hallel, go home and eat, and then you return and go back to synagogue and finish the rest of Hallel. Okay, anyone signing up for that on Seder night? Okay, it, it, it does happen in certain places. At least they do Hallel uh, at the beginning, but nobody really goes back anymore. Um, but, but you can see here, that it was so important to say Hallel as the bracket for the meal that even if you couldn't do it at your own table, you had to go out to the synagogue, do the par first part of Hallel, um, which must have been awesome, <laughs> right? To get you out there, to do that first part of Hallel, you go home, you eat, 
you come back and you finish it. So halal is surrounding the eating, okay? So in some ways, we experience halal as the end of magi, but I'm telling you, it's more like halal is the beginning of the eating, okay? Halal is kicking off the eating part. It's been no more lefana of hallelujah after I've done all the magi stuff, which is still a, bish, a mishmash for us right now, but that's where I'm headed, okay? Um, now, again, halal as the sort of high point of the Seder, we get different texts that give us a clue of how they experience halal. This is a great one here. Um, we have in the name of Rabbi Chia that the Pesach sacrifice, this is again in the days when they're eating the Pesach sacrifice, they had an olive's worth of the Pesach sacrifice, like you show up for your meal, right? <laughs> and they kind of don't have enough food for you. You only get a tiny little bit of the Pesach sacrifice, because presumably there are very many people at this Seder, okay? You get a tiny little bit of the, of the meat, but the Hallel that they sing would break the roof, right? We're, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing the house down literally, okay, with our Hallel. That's part of what my experience of this is. So there's the eating, which even takes um, sort of not center stage to the singing. The singing is really what's gonna define and characterize my experience of this, okay? So what we have here praising God is Hallel, some part of Hallel, eating the rest of Hallel. That's what we're doing, and that's the, that's the culmination of what we call Magi, but really could be its own thing. Now, how far do we go in Hallel? Well, this is where we're going to get this debate between the House of Hillel and the House of Shammai, okay? And this is an amazing sort of comment on what it means to sing Hallel at this moment in our reenactment, okay? Because imagine, you're reenacting the experience of coming out of slavery, and what ends up happening is you're singing praises to God before you've left. Okay, you're sitting there in Egypt and the, you know, the destroyer is going around destroying and you are wondering whether or not, I mean, we all had some, some parallel experience a couple of years ago, right? You all wonder, wonder, wonder whether or not I'm going to be impacted by this destruction, okay? And nevertheless, what are you doing? You're not hiding under the bed. You are singing praises to God, okay? That's the sort of spiritual orientation to singing how at this point in the night, you're in the beginning part of the night, and nevertheless, you're singing praises to God. So how much praise do we do? How much of halal do we do? Well, we get that um, uh, Beit Shammai says, you should do all the way up until the end of Psalm 113, okay? Psalm 113, verse 9, that's as far as you go. And Beit Hillel says, no, you should also go and do as much as Psalm 114. Well, Psalm 114 is the psalm that starts, B'tzei Yisrael Mimitzrayim, when Israel left Egypt, right? And what does that indicate? It seems to indicate that we already left Egypt. So how could you sit in Egypt and on the first Seder night recite a psalm that indicates that I've already left Egypt? It's kind of an amazing sort of spiritual orientation. Well, Beit Shammai says this exactly to Beit Hillel, right? We actually don't get this reported in, in the Mishnah, but we get it in the parallel text in the Tosef. The Beit Shammai says to Beit Hillel, wait a minute, have they already left Egypt that we can go on and mention the going out of Egypt? Like, are you going to sing Psalm 114, which is about leaving Egypt when we haven't even left Egypt yet? Like it's still, you know, eight o'clock. How could, how could you sing about going out of Egypt? So Beit Hillel's response is, well, even if you wait until dawn, until the cock crows, they didn't even leave until the sixth hour. They didn't leave until daytime, which seems to be a shared assumption of both Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai that they actually left in the day. So how could you say that, that um, the redemption and they still have been redeemed, meaning Beit Shammai, even according to you, even if you wait until the end of the Seder, you're still not doing the Seder. Seders can run, run late, but nobody I know has a Seder that goes until noon the next day, right? <laughs> if you were to make it to noon the next day, maybe, but, but if you're not actually doing that, then you also are saying we left Egypt before we left Egypt. And so what you end up having is um, the, the, a situation in which both according to Beit Shammai and according to Beit Hillel, uh, I mean, Beit Hillel takes the day, but Beit Hillel proves to Beit Shammai that no matter what you're going to be saying, whether it's the beginning or the end of the Seder, you're going to be saying when we left Egypt, even before we left Egypt. So there's something spiritual. It's not just about praising God. Um, it's about praising God for something that hasn't happened yet, but I trust is going to happen. When we left Egypt, a, a parallel actually might be like, uh, the, the, the famous Shira Malot that we sing on, on Shabbat and holidays for Bir Karamazon. Shira Malot, Veshuv Adonai at Shabbat Zion, Hayinu Kecholmi. Does that mean, right, we, when we return to Zion, we were like dreamers? Or does it mean when we will return to Zion, we will be like dreamers, right? And there's a sort of an ambiguous around the, the tenses there, but it's either I'm talking about the future 
or uh, like Azimo in the future, that our, that our, our, uh, our mouths will be filled with praise. And maybe that's sort of the same orientation, that I can praise God about something that hasn't happened, even as I'm sitting here in the depths of, of, the, uh, of the suffering. Okay, and hollow itself has elements of both suffering and, uh, and, 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 and rejoicing in it. Okay, um, okay. So far, what we've done is Hallel, praising, okay? Now let's see where, how far did this get us in our map here? I'm gonna just flip over the page. Um, so we get to page seven. We reshare the screen here. Let's see how much of our Magi we have unlocked, okay? Here's our bulleted list. Remember the bold part is Eretz Yisrael Agadah. And where's our color code? We got nothing color coded yet, until you get to the last two bullet points, okay? Hallel and the blessing of redemption. The blessing of redemption is the blessing that follows Hallel, which we are told in the Babylonian Talmud is, blessed are you God who redeemed Israel, Gaal Yisrael. Although in the original Mishnah and in the Eretz Yisrael Haggadot as well, it doesn't say God who redeemed Gaal, but rather God who redeems Goel Yisrael, the redeemer of Israel. And that also might align with this idea of we're singing praises to God, um, even as we're not yet redeemed, expecting that God is about to redeem us. Because we're not just reporting about the past, we're actually imagining a future in which we get redeemed, okay? But so far, in terms of unlocking, <laughs> unlocking Magid, all we've done is the last two bullet points, okay? So what does this tell us? It tells us that we have to keep on moving. I'm gonna have one quick drink of water here. Everybody gets oriented. Okay, so we've done the purple part, praising God. Hallel, which of course the second half is going to come after Magi. Let's go on to the next section, which is asking questions. We love the asking questions part. And in fact, asking questions on, on Seder night doesn't only start with Manishtana, the supposed question that the child, maybe the parent will get there in a second. Somebody's asking these questions and they seem to be questions. We love the questions. But of course, already in the Torah, we get um, an instruction to, uh, uh, th th that indicates that kids are going to ask us questions, okay? We get a couple of those instructions. Ki yishalcha bincha machar lemor, right? When your child asks you in the future, machar, tomorrow, but like in the, in the sort of big, big sense tomorrow, in the future, what are the laws and the decrees and the rules that Hashem has enjoined upon you, right? And then we get the answer that goes on actually a little bit longer than what we have in the, in the questions of the four, the four children. Um, that's in Deuteronomy. Your child asks you, and we have a very similar expression in Shemot itself in the book of Exodus. Okay, what is this? So these end up being put in the mouths of the four children. But just note, the Torah already is telling us that there's something about Pesach that involves asking questions. Okay, so you could imagine, like, think about, you know, um, Hanukkah, right? The main thing about Hanukkah um, actually, on a percentage basis, Hanukkah is nearly 50% of the Hallel that we originally were to send. We would say Hallel in the back half of Pesach, and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and so and Hanukkah, which really is sort of like a rerun of Sukkot. Hanukkah is like, let's praise God for having whatever, the, the, the oil or winning the war. Or Pick your miracle. But the point is, what's our response? Our response is actually praising God. What's our response on Pesach? It is praising God. But it's not just praising God. You could have imagined that the Hanukkah, the Hanukkah um, uh, sort of uh, the, the, the ritually required part of Hanukkah would be, tell the Hanukkah story. It's a great story. Let's tell it. But that's not what we have with Hanukkah. That's not what we have with, with really any other of the holidays. What we have instead is, just with Pesach, questions, right? Someone's going to ask you, hey, why did the oil last so long in Hanukkah? We don't have that question and answer dialogue, but we do have it with Pesach, Okay. So we have the praise, of course, that's part of what, we, what it means to celebrate in, 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 in Jewish holidays. We have it at night, we split it, and we praise while eating, but we have the praise, that's almost expected. Now we're gonna get the questions. All right, so let's take a look at the question which is unique to, um, uh, to Pesach. Okay, of course, we have Manishtana Halai Lahazeh, and shout out to all the, all the kids who are gonna be doing that this year, okay? Manishtana Halai Lahazeh, I'll just note, which has been noted uh, many different times, translated here, uh, the, the Shechter Agadah, uh, differently. It's either a question, like what is the difference between this night and all other nights? Ma as a question word, or it might be an exclamation. Ma, like how different is this night from all other nights? Like, how great are your works, O Lord? 
We read in the book of Psalms. So the word ma can be an exclamation, exclamation point at the end, or a question. Um, but even if it's an exclamation, we're going to then start to get some details about the exclamation, like, how different is this night? Let me tell you how it's different, right? Uh, or let me sort of notice and describe to you how it's different. Okay, so notice the questions that we have in our Haggadah today. First of all, of course, there are four of them. Um, but, uh, but we're going to see that that's not uh, the original orientation. But let's just get them on the table here, right? What are the four questions that we say? Chametz and matzah, other nights we eat chametz and matzah, tonight only matzah. On all the nights we eat any other kind of vegetable, um, tonight we eat bitter herbs. So, so far we've got matzah and maro, okay? Those are two significant foods. Then we have a question, on all the nights we do not even, even dip once, tonight we dip twice. What are the two dippings, by the way? It seems like the first one in our little poem is called karpas, Right, which is parsley, which is actually a word that um, was like on the last on the list things that you might use as an appetizer for a vegetable to start off the meal. But because it got into the poem, like we all got sold the line of karpas, that's what we're doing. Okay, karpas seems to be the first dipping. And the second dipping is maror, right? So you actually have two questions about maror. Just notice that. Um, right now, it's true that we, uh, in this version of the questions, we don't even dip once. Uh, on all the nights. So the fact that we dip twice, even the karpas dipping is strange, but the, it's only, it's super strange because of the maro dipping and in older versions of this, which actually show up in the Talmud, but it's, yeah, we used to dip once, now we dip twice. So there was like a normal dipping. Think about like, you know, your, your crudite, you know, appetizer, you're gonna take the carrot stick and dip it into the dip. That's normal. If I, if I start off a meal with some carrot sticks and dip, you would be like, okay, that's normal. Right? The only thing is, in the middle of the meal, if I then brought out another thing to dip, that might be not normal. And that thing that we dip is maro. So just note, in the four questions that we have, the question I have on our four questions is, how come maro gets two questions? Okay, so we've got so far matzah, maro explicitly, maro by implication, because you're, you're getting a dipping here. And then finally, we get the, on all the nights we eat sitting or reclining, tonight we all recline. And those of us who try to recline at the Seder know that it's not totally doable. And in fact, in all the nights, we don't really recline, we just sit. But that's in a world in which we all get chairs, which is kind of like a royal object that you can imagine only kings had at one point. And so maybe we're all lying down on a couch and maybe, okay, so at some point it wasn't totally obvious that it's strange to recline. In fact, a synonym for eating is reclining in ancient sources. So it's, it's like pull up a chair, recline. It means the same thing, just sort of, um, you know, culturally. But eventually that goes away. And so we're going to ask that. Okay, so what are our questions, the four questions we have here? Matzah. Maror, maror, reclining. Okay, that's our four questions. Let's take a look at the original four, four questions, which in fact are only three. Okay, and I'm taking here from the good old manuscripts of the, of the Mishnah. Um, we said that we start off Magi by pouring the second cup, and then the child asks, um, and then we have this maybe parenthetical statement, but if there's no knowledge with the child, then the, 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 the father uh, instructs him. And then we get, Watch the questions. What are they? On all other nights, um, we dip once, right? That's the carrots and the dip. Tonight, we dip twice. What's that a reference to? Maror. Okay, so question number one in the old Mishnah is Maror. The matzah question remains stable. So we've got Maror, matzah, and then finally, we eat on all the nights, meat prepared in any way, roasted, boiled, or cooked. But tonight, we only eat it roasted, below sleep. Okay? So what are the questions that we end up with in the original set here? Maror, matzah, pesach, pesach sacrifice, the meat. Okay? Those are the three foods. Does that ring a bell for anybody? We're gonna to get to the answers in just a second, okay? But the original questions seem to be about those three things and actually make a little bit more sense than the four questions we have where we're doubling down on the Maror stuff. And there's nothing about Pesach there at all. Why? Presumably because nobody is bringing out a rack of lamb that was you know, roasted to bring onto the, onto the, 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 um, the Temple Mount. That's not happening anymore. Although it does seem, does anyone ever have brisket? On, on Pesach, it does seem 
that even vegetarians might make an exception on best off and eat some meat stuff, okay? That might be a memory of, of course, the whole thing, like the Hill sandwich tastes, tastes so much better with meat, okay? If it was just matzah and maro, it's a little, little lacking in the flavor there. Um, but, but fundamentally, you could imagine a world in which you're eating the Pesach sacrifice, and so the main foods of the night that are strange or unusual or different are maror, matzah, and Pesach. That's what you have, and that's what the questions are indicating, okay? So that's on our question side. How about the answers? Well, the truth is we get a, a set of answers from Rabban Gamliel. And Rabban Gamliel, uh, who is quoted in our Haggadah, remember he says, Rabban Gamliel says, whoever hasn't said these three things at the Seder hasn't fulfilled their obligation, okay? And so what we get is a list. What are they? Be'eluhein, Pesach, Matzah, and Mirorim. Uh, the bitter herbs, which is just a quote from the verse in which that, that shows up. So you have the plural of, of maror. Uh, and then Rabban Gamla in the Mishnah gives a very short explanation of each of these, right? You asked about Pesach, let me tell you about Pesach. Pesach al shepasach hamakom apatea avotein b'mitzrayim, right? Pesach is because God passed over. The play on words of Pesach works in English as well. God passed over our houses. Um, or our ancestors' houses in Egypt, mirorim, the, the bitter herbs, because they made our lives, or the lives of our ancestors, bitter uh, in, in, in Mitzrayim. And so you have the play on words for both of those. And then matzah, al shem sheni galu. Matzah, because they were redeemed, which is interesting. It's short. It actually is not the same explanation as what we have in the Haggadah. In the Haggadah, it's all about matzah because there wasn't enough time for the dough to rise, and that's why we're going to eat flat bread. But in the Mishnah originally, matzah, because they were redeemed, which has no play on words, nothing about the rising or not rising, and seems to sort of privilege the understanding of matzah as a bread of redemption, as opposed to, if you stop someone on the street, tell me about matzah, they're going to say, bread of affliction, right? This is the, the bread that we are so happy to not eat once Pesach is over. But apparently here, matzah is an ideal symbol for redemption, not affliction. The affliction that we have in this list is maru, right? Maru, you can't interpret another way. Maru is just bitter. It's bad. But we don't finish the list with the bad. We finish the list with the redemption. And that's going to take us straight on to the hollow. Okay, so even though we said Pesach, Matzah, and Maror as the, as the three things, and in our Haggadahs today, that's the order that we do it in. Originally in the Mishnah, they said Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, and then they switched it and they, and they uh, finish off with Pesach, uh, Maror, and Matzah. Matzah is your ending on the highlight. Matzah is the redemption, and that's going to lead you to the Halal with the blessing of redemption. Okay, so once you talk about Matzah at the Seder, you're already on your way to redemption, which is the, the Halal section. Okay, so that's, that's, where we, that's where we're looking at. Now, the questions that we're saying, Manishtana, this is, again, every youngest child is going to be very interested in this little section here. Our Manishtana, is that section a script that must be recited no matter what? Or is Manishtana a plan B if nobody comes up with a better question plan A, right? Is the night supposed to be about spontaneous questions and whatever question I come up with then that's going, to be, um, that's going to be good and maybe even ideal for how I'm engaging with questions on Seder night? Or is it no? I don't care what questions. You can add whatever questions you want. You have to say Manish Tana. You're going to have to get up and recite it before everybody, and it's going to make you nervous. And if you didn't learn it in school, then you're going to get your money back. Okay, so, so this is, in fact, a debate that we see already in Talmudic sources. On the one hand, we get the following source here. Um, what page am I on? I'm still on page 10, okay? Um, we get the following source. Our sage seats, if a child is wise, then he asks him, and he asks the, the Seder leader, he asks his parents, okay? He, he says the, 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 the four questions. We're gonna see if this is what they're talking about. And if not, then other people get, can say, it, right? If, if, the, if you don't have the child's gonna do it, then maybe his wife is gonna do it. And if no one else can do it, he will ask himself. Presumably the Seder leader knows enough to ask the questions. Here it's not a question of, I've wondered about this, a curiosity question. It's, I am reciting a liturgy because I, I'm going to answer the question myself. So if I'm asking it, I'm reciting a liturgy. And even if you have two sages who know all the laws of Pesach, 
Nevertheless, they're going to ask them each one to the other. Okay, everybody is going to recite this liturgy at Seder. Manishana is meant to be recited. Okay, that's in the you need a script to get through Seder night team. Let's call that team Rabban Gamliel, who also has a scripted set of answers. Okay, now what about the other the other team? The other team is Manishana has a backup plan. Let's see how that plays out. At least in the in the, in the Babylonian Talmud, we get the following sto story. They remove the table at some point early in Magid. And the school of Rabbi Yanni says, this is so that the children will notice and they'll ask. So you do something strange, like remove the table, and then the children ask. And then we get a story. Abaye was sitting before his teacher, Rabbi. Abaye is apparently a child in this story. And he saw that they were taking the table away. He said to them, we still haven't eaten. Um, and, uh, and I'm just getting the text up here. And why are you taking the table away? And Rabbi, the teacher says to him, you've exempted us from saying Manish Tana. Okay, you've exempted us from saying Manish Tana, meaning you asked a question. So we don't have to say the scripted questions. The scripted questions are a backup plan if nobody ever asks a question. But if you ask a question, and I'm going to prompt you to ask a question by taking the table away or doing whatever I'm going to do, then you're good. Manish Tana does not have to be recited. Okay, so this, in fact, flows down through Jewish history on both ends. But of course, Haggadah at the end of the day is liturgy. And so it, you better believe it. It's going to be in our Haggadah, right? You don't have, I mean, you might have nowadays with desktop publishing and Haggadah.com and whatever. Haggadah doesn't have the four questions. But fundamentally, the, the, the scripted version of Mani Shana won the day. But I'll tell you, it's not the only questions that we get. What's the other model of questions that we get in our Seder? Not in Eretz Israel, in our Seder, though. We have the four children, right? The four sons, each of whom ask their own question, which is not the script. It's not about Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, right? Ramagavla does not answer their questions. They get their own questions and they get their own responses. And that's almost like a model of spontaneous questions by kids who want to ask something, okay? So in our Haggadah itself, we have questions that are scripted, questions that are unscripted, and an answer to the scripted questions, okay? Um, so let's just see how far we've gotten here in our list. I'm scrolling on down to page 11. I put it in red, the questions, all right? So look, again, in black is the stuff we haven't figured out yet, but we're getting a little bit closer. Four questions, that's obviously the question. The four children asking the questions, that's another round at asking questions, and then, which, by the way, doesn't show up in there, it's Israel Haggadah, okay, but, the, but it's there in ours. And then, Rabban Gamliel, Pesach, Matzah, Maror, I'm calling the answer. <laughs> a lot of Haggadah label the answer as Avadim Ayinu, we're slaves to Pharaoh, just because it comes after the four questions. But that's not actually the way it happens here. What ends up happening is you have two sets of questions. Of course, the four children's questions are answered immediately. The scripted questions are answered way at the end. Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. And then you get to the Halal, blessed, the purple's still there, okay? So now we've got two of the four elements. You've got questions, you've got phrases. Look how much material we still have left, okay? So th they are not equally weighted. And this is what I'm gonna sort of get to as we barrel towards the end here, which is, it's not only, um, it's not only uh, if you divide it into four types of things you're doing in Magi, it's not like they each get 25% of the material. Halal gets a small percentage, very important, but it, it's at the end, which is the, the great place to be. Um, but that's not uh, the bulk of it. And even the questions and their answers get a small amount of material. So what's left? We have two more things that we're doing. Okay, let's flip over to the next page, page 12. And we're going to tell the story. Machil beginut umusayim b'shvah. Okay? So, um, telling the story as part of what we're doing on Seder night, I want to argue and others have made this argument, David Arno's here, they've made this argument as well, that the telling of the story is the chiddish, is the unique thing about our Seder. You could have gone in another direction, we're gonna look at that direction right now, but we end up telling the story of going from degradation to praise, and that itself is the innovation of our Haggadah, okay? How do we know that we're supposed to tell a story? Well, it says in the Torah, you will tell Haggadah, right? You will lehagi. You will you will tell to your child on that day. And then we have um, one of the answers that we get to the four children. It's because of what Hashem did for me when I went free from Egypt. But the Haggadah part, the telling part, is part of what we're going to do tonight. 
Now, I want to say, this was not always obvious. What would you have imagined that we would do? We have, we're asking questions. That seems really important. We're going to answer the questions. You can't ask a question without getting an answer, ideally. And then we're going to praise God, because that's how you're supposed to eat the Pesach. All that sounds good to me so far. How about telling the story? Well, the truth is, it's not always the case that we were going to tell the story. You know what we were going to do on Seder night? In fact, we weren't going to talk about the story. We were going to talk about the laws. Remember when I told you that in Masech Psachim, almost all the rest of the stuff that precedes the Seder is about the laws of Chameitz and the laws of how you do the sacrifice. Laws is something that we are good at working with as a rabbinic people, okay? And indeed, who do we have um, telling, uh, uh, telling, telling that on the night of Seder, instead of telling a story, they're discussing laws? We have the following story. First of all, we get the, the statement from the Tosefta, again, this ancient level of... Um, uh, uh, of rabbinic text, Chayav Adam, a person must la sofi hochon a Pesach kol alayla. You know what you're supposed to do all night on on Pesach? You're supposed to engage in the laws of Pesach. And trust me, there are enough of them that you could do it all night. Okay, that is the obligation. It does not say Chayav lisaper b'itziat mitzrayim. It's not say you're obligated to tell the story of Egypt, but rather you're obligated to discuss, to engage with the laws of Pesach. And then we have a story about laws. Rabbi Gamliel and the elders were reclining in the house of Baitos Ben Zunin in Lod, right, a sort of rich lay person who had a nice place to have a Seder. And they were engaging in the laws of Pesach by you Asukim Behilfara Pesach Kol Halayla. All night long they were discussing the laws of Pesach until the cock crowed in the, in the morning. And then they removed the tables in front of them and they got up and they went to the Beit Midrash. They went to go to the study house to study more laws, right? But presumably to do their morning prayers as well, okay? So here we have a story of what Pesach was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a night of discussing laws. Who discusses laws? People who are at a high elite level, like the lawyers discuss laws, right? The rabbis discuss laws. Regular people aren't really gonna discuss laws. And that indeed is a, an orientation that we, uh, that we have here in, in this story. Think of this story as a contrast to the story of the five rabbis that we have as well, right? The five rabbis that we have that stay up all night, what are they staying up all night doing? They're staying up all night, not discussing the laws, but telling the story, okay? So in some ways, that, that little section of our Haggadah, which appears nowhere else in rabbinic literature, uh, and therefore might have been a sort of late, Johnny come lately to the, uh, to the texts of our people, might be responding to an orientation in which, yeah, you know what the ideal is? Stay up all night and discuss the laws of Pesach, that works for you if you're part of the elite. But indeed, instead, we have telling the story, which works for everybody, including children. Okay, so there's some sort of shifting in the values of what you're doing on Seder night that moves you from a uh, sort of elite group. All right, the, what, are the, what do the regular people do? They ask some questions, they get some answers, they sing some halal, and they eat. That's going to work for the masses, right? When Raman Gamliel says, everybody's got to say, Pesach, Matzah, Maror, so, okay, you ask about it. I'm going to tell you about it. We're going to sing a little bit, and then we're going to eat, and that's going to work for most of us. But you want to be serious about Pesach? You're going to talk about the laws. If you're Rabbi Gavi, if you're like me, I'm not only just going to talk about the minimum, I'm going to actually do all the law stuff. And you can imagine that ship sailing in the direction of Pesach is sort of like, there's two Pesach seders. One is for the elites who can discuss the laws, and one is for the rest of us, who can just do a little bit of questions, a little bit of answers, some singing, and then we're going to eat, okay? By the way, some of us might still take that trade today. But fundamentally, what's amazing about our Haggadah is they don't go down the elite road. Everybody gets to tell the story. We're not going to focus on laws at night. We're going to tell the story. And actually, in a, a great example of how this plays out is the story of uh, the four sons. Now, we know in our version of the four sons, the, the wise child asks about the laws, right? Asks about all the different kinds of laws that we say on Pesach. And how do you answer him? You tell him about the laws, including up to the, the law about the Afikon, which has some, its own interesting history. Okay, so in other words, child, the wise child asks about laws. The wise child, laws, gets an answer with laws, okay? And that's sort of a model that we see in our Haggadah. That is not the only way that the story of the four sons was told. Look at this text from the Jerusalem Talmud here. Um, we get uh, the following response to the wise child's question, right? We have the, the, the four children, and then the wise son, what does he say? 
What are the laws, statutes, and ordinances that our and our God commanded us? That's the question that remains constant, put in the mouth of the wise child. You say to him, With a strong hand, God took us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I asked about the laws, and you answered with a story. You answered with a narrative. Right? That is, a, that is a sort of like a subtle smackdown <laughs> to the idea that you could spend your night talking about laws. Instead, we have a wise child who asks about the laws, but it sort of reined in and said, you know what? We're talking about stories. Everybody's going to participate in the telling of the story. Okay? Now, what's the story that we're going to stop this here for a second? What's the story that we're actually going to tell tonight? Well, we're going to get this, um, this statement that we're going to start with Genut, with degradation, and we're going to finish with shvat, with praise. If I said to you, okay, you've got your instruction. Your instruction is to start with degradation and end with praise. What are your options? What kinds of stories might you tell given those very small instructions? You might come up with some different uh, possibilities for how you would do that. And indeed, this is what I want to argue, is what the main part of Magid is. A little part of Magid is asking questions and answers. A little part of Magid is praising God, just textual-wise. A little part of Magid is praising God. A lot of Magid is trying to tell the story from degradation to praise. We already get this, um, uh, this sense that there are multiple ways to tell this story in the, um, in the Talmud itself, where we're going to see uh, try, the, the rabbis of the Talmud trying to figure out what is the story that I'm going to move from degradation to praise? So let's take a look at this together and see the shocking result of how this Talmudic debate ends. Um, okay, I'm scrolling on down to page 13. Okay, the Talmud quotes the Mishnah and said, hold on, start with degradation, finish with praise. What does it mean to start with degradation? Tell me what degradation means. My bignut. Define your terms, please. And we get the following debate. Notice it's a debate. Rav Amar, Rav said, in the beginning, in the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshippers, right? And that's what we have in our Haggadah. And Shmuel, but really Rav in most texts of the Talmud uh, says, no, we were slaves to Pharaoh in, in Egypt. Okay, so what we have here is, what's the starting point of our story? The starting point of degradation one option is we were slaves in Egypt. You stop anybody on the street and say, what are we doing on Seder night? They're going to tell you. Yeah, we talk about the way in which we were slaves in Egypt that we became free. That is indeed one opinion, but it's only one opinion. The other opinion that's recorded in the Talmud is, no, we started as idol worshippers. And actually, we don't get the ending. Right? We don't get the ending. Presumably, and we became followers or servants to God. Okay. But the starting point, when, when were we idol worshippers, right? When were we those people who were um, in gnut, in, in shame, in degradation? Apparently, way before we even were in Egypt. Who was idol worshippers in our history? Actually, it was Abraham and his ancestors, right? That is to say, we were descended from the people who are, who are idol worshippers. Now, we're going to explore that in just a second, but I want to note here, what happens to this debate? You know, when you have a debate in the Talmud, later authorities have to come along and say, okay, there's a debate in the Talmud, that's not so terrible, but let's choose who's going to win, right? You can't, if I say something's kosher and you say something's not kosher, I can't say you're both right, okay? That's only in postmodern world, but that doesn't really work well for legal systems, okay? But notice what happens here. Right. Where do you start the story? Where does the degradation begin? Well, Rav says, in the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshippers. And Shmuel says, in the beginning, we were slaves in Egypt. And the Rif, one of the major authorities who comes through the Talmud to make laws out of the debate, who picks sides, you know what he says? Now we are going to do like both of them. That is to say, we're not actually eliminating any possibilities. You say one thing. You say the other thing, they both get encoded in our laws. They both are reasonable options, okay? And that's how we start to build out a Magid section that is going to run the experiment of start with degradation, end with praise, and run it again and again and again and again. 
Okay, so one of the most obvious places, and what Haggadah today usually points out is, you got the first version of that. We start with Avadim Hayinu in our order. That's the second opinion in our Gemara. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, but then later on, we get that in the beginning, our, our ancestors were idol worshippers. So both of them end up encoded in our Haggadah. Start your story in different places, even though you're trying to understand what degradation is, and that's where we where we end up being and, and finding ourselves. Now, once you go down the path of now we do both of them, we're going to really go to town on this one. And once you start looking in the Magid section for an arc, a story arc that starts with degradation and ends with praise, you're going to see it all over the place. I want to give you just a couple of examples as we move towards the end here, okay? So um, uh, let's see. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's still on page 13. We have Rav's opinion that appears in, in the Talmud Yerushalmi, in the Jerusalem Talmud, in which Rav tells us where he wants to start this story of, uh, in the beginning, our, idols, our ancestors were idol worshippers, and he quotes these verses from the book of Joshua. At the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua gets up, tells the whole people, here's the story of the Jewish people. It's a fairly long narrative, and it starts off, across the river, that's where your ancestors lived. And then I took your father Abraham across the river to this side of the river. Now look at the arc of that story. Just look at what Rav quotes from this story. The story goes on. But what Rav quotes in this story is degradation, idol worshipers on the other side of the river. Praise, took your father, brought him to this side of the river. The whole story is finished with Abraham. I mean, we didn't even get to Egypt. Uh, to get to the end of the story, we did the whole, the whole thing is the journey from idol worship to monotheism, which is long over before we are going down to Egypt as slaves. We know where the story is going because we've already been there with our, with our ancestors, okay? And that gets encoded in our Haggadah. So both the statement of Rav in the Babli that says the being our idols were, were uh, uh, our ancestors were idol worshippers, the statement of Rav ends up in the Haggadah, and Rav's version of that that shows up in the Yushalmi, also ends up in the Haggadah, the verses from Joshua. So all of a sudden you tell these verses from Joshua on the other side of our ancestors who were living on the other side of the Euphrates. That is a version of the story from degradation to praise. So now in our Haggadah, we've got, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. In the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshippers. And on the other side of the river lived our ancestors. That's three versions of moving from degradation to praise. And it just goes on from there. Like we have in the Haggadah. The, the, the promise that God makes to Abraham in the, in the covenant of the pieces, this is on the bottom of page 13, right here with Genesis uh, uh, 15, we, we see that God says to, uh, to Abraham, know that your children will be strangers in a country that is not their own, and they'll be enslaved and mistreated there. But I'll punish the nation if that they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with rikush gadol, with great possessions. Okay, so maybe here it's the, what is the aspect of slavery? You have no ownership of anything of your own. And what's the opposite of that? The phrase flip side of that? You're going to come out with a great set of property. Okay, and this again is telling that arc from degradation to praise. And when you sort of find this and move your way through the Haggadah, we're going to have it over and over again. Halach ma'anya. right? This is the bread of affliction that we start off our Magi with, not an Eretz Yisrael, but an our Magi. Right? We say, this is the bread of affliction that our ancestors ate, degradation. Anybody who's hungry, come and eat. Praise. Right? We've come to the other side of an ark. I used to eat poor man's bread, and now I can feed everybody in my neighborhood. Open the door. Anybody who wants to come eat. This year, we are here. Next year, in the land of Israel. That's another orientation. Degradation and praise as geography. I start here. That's not where I want to be. I want to be in the, in the promised land. That's there. I might get there next year, right? This year we're slaves, next year we're free. You notice Halach Ma'ani is giving you three mini versions of degradation to praise, okay? So when you're looking through Magi, you're saying, oh, am I looking at, at something that is actually a degradation to praise flow? Dayenu, we love Dayenu. Does anyone sing all the verses of Dayenu to that great, great Day, Dayenu tune? It would take a long time. And if you don't sing the whole thing, you kind of miss the point of the poem, which is to say, you know what? We started with, right, took us out of Egypt and went through all these stops on the way to, where do we end Dayenu? We ended in, 
uh, brought us to the land of Israel, built for us the Beit HaBechira, the chosen house, God's dwelling place on earth, to atone for all of our sins. What's praise here? Praise is, yes, we sin. We were sitting in Egypt and we're sitting now, but now we get to have a place where God's presence is felt that is going to atone for our sin. We've made it to the other side of the story arc. Okay, so what you have again and again and again in the Magid section is these four short words, Machil Beginut, Messiah Mishra, start with degradation, and in praise gets run and rerun and rerun with different options, okay? And that itself as a meta experience of what we're doing on Seder night, I want to argue, is part of the goal, right? We get this uh, statement at the end of the paragraph here on the bottom, page 14, Abadim Ayinu, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and of course, if, even if all of us were X, Y, and Z, you know, all of us were sages and learned and knew the Torah, nevertheless, we'd have to tell the story about the exodus from Egypt and Bechol Amar Belisaper Vitziat Mitzrayim in our versions, whoever increases in the telling of the story of the story of going out of Egypt, Hareze Mishuba, he is praiseworthy. That's the Sheva, the Shva. Okay. So you have a meta Shva, which is the more you tell the story, the more praiseworthy it is. Okay. So if Seder seems long. It's supposed to be long, because if all you did was tell the story, we were slaves in Egypt and we got out, right? Or our idols were an ancestors were idol worshippers, and then God chose Abraham. All you did was tell one story, you'd be missing the point, which is to tell the story over and over again, to di pick different points of starting and ending, and that itself is praiseworthy, okay? So when you take a look at the map, now let's take a, the, uh, a look at the map here. Um, there's some other examples here that we could say in terms of the, uh, the story. But look at it. I put it in blue. All right. So where are we now? We're on page 16. Look what we put in blue here. All of these blue sections are moving from degradation to praise. Okay. Including the five rabbis who stay up all night in B'nai Brak telling the story. They are telling that story. Uh, ben Zoma has, a, that's the previous page we didn't look at, but Ben Zoma has a story in which, yeah, how, how long do we tell the story about going out of Egypt? Is it eternal or is it only for now? That itself is a version of telling the story. Could it be, Yachome Rosh Chodesh is a midrash on, it's a midrash on telling the story. Um, in the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshippers. That's Rav's opinion. It's quotes from Joshua. The covenant of the pieces we just saw. Dayenu. All this stuff is telling the story. Just look from a content perspective. How much of Magid, text-wise, is telling that story from degradation to praise? Over and over and over again. Okay? So what we are doing in Magid is telling this story. Yes, we have questions and answers. Yes, we have Halal. But fundamentally, the part that got expanded, the, 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 the non-bold part, right, that is our Haggadah, the Babylonian tradition Haggadah, is we're doing all of it. We're, you, you say this is the story, you say that is the story, great, everybody's story is welcome, we're going to tell them all. And that's how this gets very long, but also very interesting, because stories are not simple, there are multiple options of how you could do it. Okay, what's our missing piece here? What's still the, uh, the part that's in black that we haven't categorized? That's the very last section, which is expounding. Okay, the doresh, the, the, the drasha, the, um, the part that we're going to actually tell as a midrash. And here we go back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, tells us explicitly, the doresh, and you should expound from Arami Oved Avi, from my, well, the, the Haggadah reads it as my, 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 an Aramean tried to destroy my father, until you finish that whole section in the Torah. Now, the truth is, we don't even follow the instructions of the Mishnah because the whole section of the Torah goes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, all the way through chapter, uh, De Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 11, okay? So 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, those are the number of verses until you finish the parasha, the section, okay? But we actually, you know, mercifully or not, only go part of that way, and where we stop reading these verses and doing drashot on them, doing expositions on them, this is where all the stuff around the 10 plagues shows up, all that stuff, that is only on verse 8. Look at verse 9, though. Even if you had finished the sentence, finished the thought, the, uh, the, the Torah tells us that it doesn't end with God brought us out from Egypt by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, awesome power, signs and wonders. That's what our Haggadah drushes to be the ten plagues. But then the next sentence is, God brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's like almost there, but not quite there. And indeed, 
The movement from we are exiled and now we're in our promised land is not the main story that we tell on Seder night because we are in fact in diaspora and exile as is the Babylonian tradition sitting in Babylonia, not in Eretz Israel, not in the land of Israel. However, it peaks in here and there. Dayenu, the story ends getting to the land of Israel. Halach ma'anya, the shana ba'ara di Israel. Next year we're going to the land of Israel, right? Even in some of the tellings um, uh, uh, returning to the land, um, th there are some landed approaches here to what our, 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 our story is here. But just note, the verses that we choose to do a drasha on stop right before we get to the land. <laughs> we only do the drashas on the verse that is about us leaving, not about us ending up somewhere. Okay, and these are the verses that are done in a, in a drasha, in a exposition. And indeed, there are many versions of that exposition. If you're going to look at the version that's near to Israel Agada, it's a shorter version than what we have. There are many expansions, like the 10 plagues. We go on and on about the 10 plagues. That's just jumping off these verses. That is our fourth activity that we're doing here. Okay, we have our map. Let's take a look at our map one last time. Um, so we're on page 18. Now every section of Magid is color-coded. Okay, so although it's not ordinal, it's not your sixth grade writing teacher would give you like a C minus because you're not quite getting the outline right. But in terms of categories, we've got our categories, right? You can see just in terms of frequency, the blue as telling the story from degradation to praise, which sort of interweaves with the questions part. And then you have the drusha part, which is green, a little bit more blue, and then you get the answers, a little bit more blue, and then you get how. That is, the, if our Magi seems a little mixed up, it's because it's being interlaced with telling the story. Telling the story is not like a thing that you do and you move on from. It's the thing you do and then do something else to come back to telling the story. Do something else to come back to telling the story. Telling the story over and over again, different starting and ending points. How about in Eretz Israel? What was, if you just look at that simpler, shorter Eretz Israel Haggadah, I'm turning us to the last page here. So what do we get here? Look how simple it is. Look at how sort of elegant it is. You start with the four, but really three questions in the red. You've got Rabban Gamliel waiting for you with the answers in the second red. The, in every generation, which I put in smaller font, actually doesn't appear in the old versions of the Mishnah, so I'm putting that to the side for now, even though it does end up in Eretz Yisrael because they're quoting the Mishnah. But look at it. You've got questions, answers, and in between the question and the answer, sort of later to the game, you've got telling the story, which is fairly abbreviated compared to our telling the story in Babylonia, and the drasha, the, the exposition of the verses in the green, right? So red is the launching point, telling the story in blue, drushing the verses, ex ex expounding on the verses in green, you get your answers in red, and then you're moving on to hollow. That is an elegant Haggadah that you have there. You can see how our Haggadah just goes wild on the blue font, goes wild on going from degradation to praise. And what we have here again, just last time, is the, the four elements that come out of our mission. Okay, so my hope here is that we, what we've been able to do is to at least color code the Magid section into the different components that we're doing so that when we get to a particular section, we can say, oh, now I know what I'm doing here. Now I know which aspect of Magid I'm trying to, uh, to fulfill. And uh, my hope is that uh, the meaning that can uh, e uh, emerge from some of the understanding of the structure um, will allow us to go deeper into the into Seder night uh, as well. I'm going to pause here to take a drink and Morty has some questions maybe or questions from the folks who are in the room uh, as well. So you're gonna tell me what to do. <laughs> take a question here, okay, please. Uh, okay. I'll repeat the question for those on Zoom, okay? So just hold on one second. So um, this is coming, this question is coming from an uh, understanding that uh, in Eretz Yisrael, the ways that liturgy was used is different from in the rest of Babel. As in, in the rest of Babel, it was very centralized in such a way that there were not many centralized places for the normal Jew to have access to learning. So it was centralized so that everybody would have the same everywhere they were. And in Eretz Yisrael, it would be everybody was there, everybody knew what you needed to do, and everybody had, so to say, the basic knowledge to add their own and mix it up. Um, so that being said, when we look at the very 
um, very basic seeming order and components of the market of the Seder in Eretz Yisrael, do you really think that their Seder was so short and basic, or do you think they just everybody had the understanding this is the basic? Uh, and we have so much knowledge and that we could just share Good. here in our Seder and everybody else didn't really, they needed the script. They Good, okay, so the question is basically in Bavel, where there was sort of a tendency to script things based on the population and the style of how we interacted with, with, um, with our tradition and our liturgy there, versus in Eretz Yisrael, where there was more going off script, off book, even in some of the davening, even in some of the prayers there, is it really the case that they had a shorter Haggadah or was it like the non-scripted part doesn't appear? And therefore, it, it was in fact a long, a long night, but we just don't have a record of that. It's a very interesting uh, uh, question because, in some ways, it's parallel to what we experience with Eretz Yisrael versus Babel around our normal prayers, right? In, in Babylonian normal Sidor, which is all the Sidor that we use today, no matter which geographic rite we're using, it's descended from Babylonian prayers. It's very scripted. You can't deviate from even one Babylonian authority says even one letter. You can't move, you can't deviate from the script. Uh, whereas in Eretz Yisrael, they were reciting poems that were only discovered later when they opened them up in the Geniza, and it turned out that there were a lot of freewheeling aspects of prayer in the Eretz Yisrael tradition. So it'd be interesting if we had a, like a heavy poetic um, um, sort of uh, tradition in the Eretz Yisrael. And we do have some poets who were famous for writing poems for the entire cycle of the year, who also wrote poems for Seder night. We have one of them that appears in Erdar Haggadah uh, tonight, uh, nowadays, by Yiba Chatzi Alayla, uh, and Behold in the Middle of the Night, from Yanai, who is an old Eretz Yisrael, ancient Eretz Yisrael poet. So it's possible that there was more going on there in the Eretz Yisrael Haggadah than the sort of basic script that we find here. But what's amazing is, like, they actually found and printed, like, you know, um, Dana Goldschmidt prints the er old Eretz Yisrael Haggadah. It's so short. It's tiny. It's like, you know, 12 pages, like this size paper, okay? And they're just like, here are the quick words, we're done. Um, so maybe it was like the, the regular people at Eretz Yisrael didn't have a poet or didn't, you know, have that opportunity in their local community. Maybe they were just burning through it like the color-coded version we have here. Or do you have some? Yeah, we have a, maybe you can repeat it. Uh, is another example of starting with degradation and ending with praise the movement from pour out your wrath to not to us, Adonai, but to your name, give the glory? Does that make sense? Uh -huh. So at the end of the Seder, we yes. have this recitation of verses that starts with and then, but rather the praise part would be um, those who know your, your name. Yeah. Is, is that it? Right. So it's interesting. Once you start looking for it, you might see it sort of everywhere. And, that, and actually that, um, that uh, recitation is something that's added much later to the Haggadah, even in the ancient Babylonian version, that's, that's not there. Um, I think it's an interesting sort of meta question about where do you and your Seder folks think the degradation and the praise should be focused, right? If you have all these options, let's say there's 10 different options that the Seder is giving you. Are you on... The, the landed team, and you know, only when we get to the promised land, that's when we've made it there. Is it only when the nations know your name? That's when we've got there, uh, the idol worship side of things. Is it only we were slaves in Egypt and now we're free, and that's the movement that I want to tell? In other words, I guess what I'm, tur I'm turning the question back on you and saying, if you think that's a reasonable story you could tell, I want to hear it. That's sort of the, the, the nature of, of Seder night. Maybe we'll take one, one, one or two more. Morty, do you have any? Any questions here? Okay, so nice to be with all of you uh, tonight and uh, really a pleasure uh, wishing everybody a happy Pesach and thank you to Jeffrey Stern and the Old Stern family. Um, we'll see you later. I'm going to say one, one commercial for a darn thing. We are starting a, uh, um, our national Shabbaton is taking place November 11th to 13th. So mark it in your calendar. We're getting back together, all together. We're going to spend Shabbat together. It's going to be amazing November 11th the 13th. And if you want to do more learning with me or any of the Hadar faculty, just Google the Hadar virtual Beit Midrash and you can do more learning with us. I hope to see you and learn with you soon.